all right we are live we are live and the audience has started streaming again i'm going to give a moment for everyone to connect so i'm just going to wait for a few seconds those of you who are in the room already and are able to hear me loud and clearly this is an audio test as well please let us know the city that you're dialing in from so in the chat window just quickly type out the city that you're dialing in from okay i see the responses coming in i see kavit from hyderabad i see rita from delhi Varun from Mumbai, Ruthvik from Mumbai. Okay, I see four responses so far. I see someone, Nitya from Hyderabad, uh, Sporty from Mumbai, Mandar from Mumbai as well. So quite a few Mumbai people. Keep those coming. Let us know the city you're dialing from, dialing it from. It's always good for us to know where the audience is coming from. Uh, I see someone from Surat as well. If any of you are dialing in from outside of India, do let us know that as well. So if you're in any other country, any other city outside of India, uh, just let us know where you're dialing it from. Okay. I see quite a few Delhi, Surat, Hyderabad, all over the place. So quite a few across the country. I'm going to wait for a few more seconds. I have 100, more than 100 people in this room right now. Uh, we have around 1,000 registrations for this session. So I'm expecting another 100, 200 to come into this room very soon. So I'm just going to give them a second for, give, up some, give them some time to connect before I kickstart this session. I see Krishnam from Tashkent as well. So hey, Krish Krishnam, great to have you over here. I see Laiba from Lahore. Thank you for dialing in Laiba. And I see someone from Belgaum as well. Okay, great. So I have quite a few people in this room right now. We have a very interesting session happening today. We did a session around marketing last week as well. This is a follow on. This is also another session in the same theme of marketing today. So that's what we are going to speak very shortly. We are going to talk about how psychology influences marketing or influences consumer behavior, which can be leveraged by marketers to effectively target to the audience. So we're going to speak about all of this very shortly. We are going to speak with Dr. Johan Pereira, who's a faculty at George Washington School of George Washington University School of Business. We're going to speak to him very soon and get into a lot of details. But before I do that, before we get into the conversation and I do detailed introductions, what I want to quickly do is run our poll, our first poll for the evening, and just to get an understanding of what function of business that you're most interested in. So if you're able to see on your screen right now, the poll is live right now. There are 158 people in this room. I would expect all 158 or all 160 of you to respond to this poll if you can. Uh, if you're dialing in from your cell phone at the bottom right of your screen, you'll see three dots. Click on that and then you'll be able to see the poll tab, which you can click and open this poll and respond to it as well. So let us know the business function that you're most interested in. Are you interested in making a career in marketing? I understand a lot of you are undergraduate college students right now. So you may not have a clear distinction about what where your interests lie. But if you have some preferences as of now, some leanings to as of now, let us know which business area you're most interested in. Is it marketing? Is it finance? Is it operations? Is it technology information systems? Is it in the domain of strategy? Or is it something else that appeals to you more? Uh, don't worry, even if your interest area is not marketing, it's all right. Whichever line of business you get into, it's always good to have an understanding of the other functional areas of business as well. All of these are interconnected organizations. Don't just run because of one function area, they succeed because all of these function areas work in tandem and then it's a successful organization. So irrespective of what your interest is, let us know what is your area of interest and you're still most welcome to attend this session. You don't need to drop out, drop off just in case marketing is not your function of interest. Still attend. It's an extremely informative session. You'll get to learn quite a bit. You'll get to see a sample of teaching that happens at George Washington School of Business. So let us know uh, what is your area of interest. Great. So thanks, Harish. Thank you for letting us know about that. Okay, I have around 141 responses to this poll, so I'm going to end the poll now and share the results as well. Great. So around 29% of our audience is looking to build a career in marketing or interested in marketing as a function of an area. 22% uh, is finance, 24% is technology information systems, 10% uh, in strategy, others, and then 6% in operations. So great, thank you for letting us know this. This is extremely insightful. Coming to the introductions now, I'm gonna take a very short minute to do these quick introductions. My name is Sanjay Dingra. I'm a co-founder and chief operating officer at Seed Global Education Limited. We are a UK headquartered company that facilitates interaction between top global universities and prospective students like yourselves, giving you a chance to connect with the faculty from these top institutions, get a taste of the teaching that happens at these universities, and make more informed decisions about your higher education or career plan. So we help you do all of this. So we help you uh, with such interactions. 
Our today's session is with George Washington University School of Business. As I said, we are interacting with, with Dr. Johan Ferreira, who is a Assistant Professor of Marketing at GWSP, George Washington School of Business. In this masterclass, we are going to talk about how marketeers use an understanding of psychology to influence consumer behavior. All of us are consumers, right? We all consume buy something as well. And even without us realizing, we may be getting influenced by these marketeers, right? And this is, and you may be doing this in the future as your career as well. So in today's session, we are going to understand how marketeers leverage the uh, power of psychology to influence consumer behavior. Uh, coming to Dr. Ferreira, he is, he received his PhD, MSc, and MSc and BSc in organic chemistry and the BSc in applied mathematics and chemistry from Free State University in South Africa. He also, he also holds an MBA from Rutgers University uh, in New Jersey in the United States. And he's of course lived in South Africa and uh, North America now. He started his career at Fisher Scientific International where he adapted products to local markets across the Americas, so North and South America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Asia Pacific as well. So he's got enough, a lot of industry experience as well before coming into academia and uses this experience to teach courses in global marketing, pricing strategy, consumer behavior, new product development, advertising, and many more. So we are going to speak with him now. I'm going to hand over the class to him to take us to his interesting masterclass. Post his masterclass, we'll also speak to Kathleen from the admissions team of GWSB. So we'll understand about the programs offered by GWSB. There's an application fee waiver code, which is in the pipeline. There's also some special scholarships reserved for attendees of this session. So stay with us till the very end. But now let's start with the masterclass with Dr. Johan Ferreira. Over to you, Johan. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay, and good evening to everybody. Thank you very much for joining the discussion today. Um, so I wanted to share with you um, a glimpse of how marketing impacts us um, without even knowing. I think Sanjay said it absolutely correctly that um, so much of the marketing that we encounter every day, um, we encounter subconsciously. And so part of the, um, the discussion this morning is to give you a flavor for our understanding of that and then to show you how marketers, um, how marketers apply it. So before, before we get into it, um, I built this presentation under the assumption that uh, that some of you may know marketing, some of you may not be aware of how we think about marketing. Um, what you have depicted on the slide, though, is the generic process through which consumers go to solve problems. And that really is the place where marketing, marketing starts. We recognize that a target audience has a problem to solve. We call that need recognition. Then they will go ahead, members of the target audience will go ahead and um, look for information to solve the problem. That's intuitive. First place we look, though, is in our memory. And so that's already a clear hint as to why the study of consumer behavior and specifically psychology ends up being very important. We evaluate the alternatives to solve the problem. Ultimately, we make a purchase decision. And then afterward, we evaluate whether that went well or not. So key question I have for you is when was the last time you went through this process? You can just put your answers in the chat. Um, let's see, let's see what you say in response to when last did you go through this uh, process? Anybody? Ashwini says, um, never tried the process. Anybody else? while buying a smartphone, right now for ordering food, every day, this morning, never. Arlene said never, and it just says uh, sometimes. Okay, that is great. Well, the answer to this question is, you go through this process as a consumer every day, all the time, because if you are hungry, you have a need. So then you have to find information to solve the problem. You evaluate your alternatives and the process happens. Um, so for those of you who claim never to have gone through this process, I have a surprise for you. You have been going through this process your entire life and probably go through it um, hundreds, if not thousands of times during the course of um, the day to solve 
sometimes what appears to be menial problems, sometimes to solve um, significant problems. So that then brings the, the role of marketing into play. Um, what is it that we try to do with marketing? Um, from a communications perspective, we try to move consumers through this process very effectively, ultimately with the goal of helping them solve their problem or satisfying their need. Now, um, if, you, if you think about your own life, the types of problems that you solve vary very much. Sometimes you are interested in buying toiletries, let's say a bar soap, let's say a tube of toothpaste. Those are routine problems that don't require a lot of thought. Other times you have big problems to solve. Let's say you're buying a house. Let's say you're deciding where to go study. Let's say you are deciding, to, deciding where to go on vacation. Those decisions that you're trying to make require typically a lot of effort. And so what marketers do is we recognize that um, not all problems are created equally. And so for the bigger problems, the more difficult problems that we solve, um, we have one way of thinking. And for the more habitual routine problems, we think in a slightly different way. The two models we use for that are called the consumer processing model, um, which is very much rational, and, and devoted to understanding how people think about big problems when uh, to solve. And then we also have uh, what we call the hedonic experiential model, which governs our behavior when we are solving simple routine problems, buying a cup of coffee, buying a tube of toothpaste, just doing uh, making decisions to solve problems um, that we need to do as quickly and efficiently as possible. So what I wanted to do is to give you a glimpse um, of the some of the key, key steps involved in the consumer processing model. This, by the way, is a very famous model uh, brought to us by William McGuire uh, way back in the 1970s, but it is a model that has stood the test of time. And so what McGuire said was, look, when you have a problem, you start to look for information. So for you to recognize that uh, uh, what a marketer has to offer is a potential solution. You have to be exposed to it. Um, once you're exposed to it, you must pay attention to the particular solution. Otherwise, it just goes in on one end, out on the other, and it may not um, have effect. Um, key in, in paying attention to a marketing stimulus is our perception. The way in which we use the term in this setting is with a reference to our senses, so our eyes, our ears, our nose, our touch, our smell. Ultimately, the consumer has to understand what they're dealing with. Um, is it a brand? Is it a marketing offering? What is it that they, that they are being presented with? Um, and then they need to internalize it and make sense of, of the stimulus as a potential solution to their problem. Um, Understanding what the market is trying to say is not enough, though. The consumer has to agree with what you are proposing um, to the extent that they will commit it to memory. Um, and when the solution, when the problem arises again, they would be able to retrieve the solution that you as the marketer propose um, to solve their problem. Um, Hopefully, they will view your solution as the very best way in which to solve their problem, and then they will take action. And so what McGuire has, um, has done with his model, the consumer processing model, is to, is to present us with granular understanding of how consumers behave when they are presented with potential solutions to the problems that they have on a daily basis. Okay. So with that said, um, I wanted to share with you some, some basic basics of the first couple of steps within the amount of time that we have. So this thing, exposure, um, it sounds like a trivial thing, but it is actually incredibly important. Um, the big challenge marketers have today is that all of us as consumers are presented with thousands of stimuli every day. And so Every marketer has to compete 
with other marketers that are trying to get a bit of time from the consumer. What it practically boils down to is that we have maybe five to eight seconds to get our message across to consumers in general. Think about this, five to eight seconds. Um, any marketer who somehow believes that they have the benefit of consumers spending um, many minutes, hours on their, on their um, stimuli are in a very, very unique position because the vast majority of, vast majority of marketers clamor for, for consumer attention. So formally, um, exposure simply refers to the process by which we put consumers in contact with, um, with a marketing stimulus, with that marketing stimulus then presenting a potential solution to the consumer's problem. The exposure is necessary, but it's not quite sufficient because ultimately what we tell the consumer with our stimulus the quality of that and the frequency with which we, we repeat the message um, are the three key factors that ultimately get the message to stick. So how do we, how do we go about gaining exposure? Um, there are many different ways in which marketers do this. Uh, three of the more important ones are the position of an ad within a medium, um, product placement, and uh, product distribution and shelf placement. Now you'll notice here that um, the material that I'm presenting tends to be agnostic to any specific industry. Um, nevertheless, nevertheless, the principles apply to a greater or lesser extent uh, depending on the context. So um, that's just a side comment in terms of how we think about um, the psychology. Let me show you a couple of things about um, the position of an ad in a medium. These are simple things, simple things that so many marketers get wrong um, just because they don't necessarily spend time thinking carefully about exposure. Um, the first thing is uh, whenever you place ads, whether it's on a website or in a magazine or in a newspaper, you have to think about how people physically behave when they read stuff. Um, so the second bullet there is something called above the fold. And what I, what I put on the screen is just, uh, just a, sc a screenshot of having Googled kibbles. Kibbles are dog treats um, sold across the United States. And so what immediately comes up would be kibbles and bits, kibbles, Wikipedia page, and that's it. If I wanted to look at any additional information, I would have to scroll. And therein lies the problem. We know that many consumers are so strapped for time or behave in a way that if they have to scroll, we've lost them. They will simply look at the first thing that comes up and that's it. And so what that then leads to are things like search engine marketing, search engine optimization, because it is critical for the marketer to serve up their potential solution to a problem without requiring the consumer to do much work beyond that, okay? The second example is something called um, um, right-hand pages, um, which generally refers to how we, how we read newspapers. So the screenshot that I have on this slide comes from uh, a South African um, newspaper, um, newspaper. If you look at this newspaper, the really interesting thing about it is you don't see any ads in the top of, of the paper. There's nothing there. Instead, instead, we see the ads toward the bottom, toward the bottom. And so that is a simple manifestation of the fact that in the West, when we read, it typically is from the left to the right and from the top to the bottom. So if the marketer were to place their ads in the top left of the page, um, consumers would find this typically very disturbing and likely ignore it. Um, instead, what we have to recognize is that where people's eyes will naturally go when they read a spread is from the top left down toward the bottom right. So in general, in this direction, which then gives the marketer a clue that when it comes to exposure, I have to 
pick this piece of real estate in a magazine, in a newspaper, or what have you. Okay. Oops, sorry, 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 there we go. Um, <clears throat> the next, the next um, key tactic is something called product placement. This is a very important one to, um, to be aware of. Product placement is a form of brand integration. And um, that simply means we depict a brand, which you can see as a solution to a problem, as an integral part to some other form of entertainment or content or content. Okay. The, the, the reason why product placement is so effective as a way in which to gain exposure is because consumers don't view product placement as marketing or advertising. You have to appreciate that uh, consumers are smart. So they will be aware when we're overtly trying to market them, to market to them. And when that happens, they become very skeptical. So a way in which to get around that uh, skepticism or that hurdle, if you would, is to present our marketing in a way as if it's not marketing. Um, and that is the essence of that is the essence of uh, product placement, specifically brand integration um, in general. So I'm always a little bit conflicted about showing people the next slide because I know many, 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 many of us are great fans of James Bond movies, but I'll put it up. There you have it. If you ever want to look for a great example of product placement, look no further than bond movies. They are the best examples of product placement. It works really well because we're all following the plot. We want to see what bond is up to next. Um, and we don't necessarily notice that we are being exposed to tons and tons of brands. Um, yes, we are seeing them, but we're not fixated on them. However, when you as a consumer are exposed to a brand, that brand goes into your subconscious mind where it gets processed as a potential solution to a problem that you may have at some point in the future. So James Bond movies are the best example of product placements. And I, like I said, I'm very sorry if I've ruined Bond movies for you because the next time you watch one, you will likely likely be looking for the products instead of focusing on the plot. Um, here's another example. These are a couple of screenshots from social media. Um, on the left, I have Instagram. On the right, I have TikTok. And in the middle, I have Snapchat. Um, so, so I show this to you because um, when you look at these um, screenshots, at first blush, they look no different from regular posts that you would be um, likely encounter on, on any of these social media platforms. As such, they're examples of what we call um, native advertising, which is another form of brand integration where you're just scrolling through your social media feed. And every now and again, you scroll by one of these posts that look just like another regular post. Now, um, in the United States, these um, ads are required to be identified. So you see the Wall Street Journal, and there is a little sign, sign that says it is sponsored content. Um, with TikTok, you see at the bottom appraisal tool, is it a fair price, it is sponsored content. The vast majority of consumers just quickly scroll through this. It doesn't strike their fancy, however, their perceptual system picked up on these potential solutions to products that, to problems they may have. And so then what happens is the stimuli go into the consumer's subconscious mind. They don't realize it's there, but at some point in the future, they may think, you know what? I would like to subscribe to a financial newspaper. And what comes to mind? The Wall Street Journal. The consumer has no idea how or why they somehow thought about the Wall Street Journal. They just know about it. And voila, a big part of the marketer's job 
is done insofar as exposure is concerned. The next step in the cascade is attention. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Attention refers to um, the consumer's willingness to deploy cognitive resources to a stimulus. Okay, so being exposed is okay, but it's it's not enough. What the consumer has to do is to pay attention to the stimulus. Attention is limited, and there's only so much of it that we have. Attention is selective. That means we can decide to what we want to direct our cognitive resources. And then the third, third key aspect of attention is that it can be divided. So as you listen to my talk to you about the psychology of consumer behavior, at the same time, you may be looking at something on your, um, your iPhone um, just to keep up with business, work, family, and what have you. So it's very possible to, to divide your attention. Of course, therein lies the problem for the marketer because um, when all is said and done, I don't want you to divide your attention. Instead, I want you to focus on what I have to say to you as a marketer. That then leads to all sorts of really, really interesting creative things. Um, our understanding of attention is that it could be focal. So if you are talking to somebody, you're looking them in the eye and you are trying to convey something, they will likely be paying focal attention to you. Non-focal attention means your attention is divided amongst different stimuli. And then there's this very interesting um, type of attention we call pre-attentive processing. Pre-attentive processing refers to your peripheral vision. And that means something that you just pick up through the corner of your eye. That's it. What the research tells us is pre-attentive processing leads to brand liking. It leads to brand familiarity. It leads to brand consideration. It has many positive effects. And so what I put on the slide is a billboard. If you look at it carefully, it's a billboard um, for a nose trimmer of all things. Okay, you have a gentleman, obviously um, with, with pronounced um, nasal hair, nose hair. Um, but if you look at this carefully, then you'll see that um, what goes through his nostrils are actually uh, power lines, telephone lines. And so this is a billboard on the side of the road. Um, as a way for the marketer to get your um, attention. Um, okay, so sometimes consumers or uh, marketing novices will, will wonder to themselves, with the world having become so digital, why do we even waste time making billboards? Okay, now you have an answer. We make billboards because as you're driving down the road, and paying attention to the road in front of you, you're passing the billboard. You don't realize it, but in your per, through your peripheral vision, you are detecting the stimulus. It goes into your unconscious mind where it's processed. And so at some point in the future, you are looking to buy somebody a gift. Um, they may happen to have problems with their nostrils, their nasal hair, and you somehow think or you remember that Panasonic may have a good way in which to trim your nasal hair. You have no idea why you thought about that. Nevertheless, you have, you have the answer. The benefits of pre-attentive processing. So if ever you work in business, maybe not in marketing, and a marketer tells you, listen, I want to I wanna run a billboard or I want to make one of those really annoying pop-ups on your screen, which you immediately close down. Just recognize that um, it has tremendous benefit in exposing consumers unconsciously to potential solutions to their problems. Okay. This is the key message from, um, from the discussion we're having today. Um, you'll hear statistics that the average consumer is being exposed to literally thousands of stimuli to every day. And then you take a step back and you think about your own life and you go, no, that cannot be. I read the newspaper, I look at my, my phone, I perhaps watch, um, watch the news. How can it be that I'm exposed to thousands of stimuli? The fact is the vast majority of those stimuli are detected 
um, unconsciously, where it's processed. Um, you see on this slide, the quote unquote scary thing is that um, we as consumers can consciously process seven plus or minus two bits of information at any given point in time. Well, unconsciously, we can process vastly, vastly more, up to 20,000 different bits of um, information that ultimately, ultimately explains how somehow or uh, why marketers continue to do what they do. How do we attract attention? We make things personally relevant to folks. Um, here is an example. Um, one of the most powerful ways in which to drive personal relevance is to appeal to people's values. And so in this particular case, you have an investment firm that simply uses freedom, security, peace of mind to appeal to people's values. How does this work? The ad goes out. Um, Allen and company knows that it may not be appropriate for everybody, but for that subset of consumers for whom freedom, security, peace of mind are important, Allen and company will likely be a very viable solution or option to some of their problems. Here's another way. For those of you who've uh, watched the Super Bowl um, in the United States, most of you are familiar with the Clydesdales. And so it's a very well-known trick in marketing to use something we call the puppy factor to grab consumers' attention. So that means we use attractive models, we use babies, we use pets and other animals. Typically, people respond really well to it psychologically. We know the neuroscience tells us it leads to the release of endorphins and other chemicals that just help us focus our attention. And so um, we, then, we then learn more about this particular marketing stimulus. A couple of additional things for you. Um, perception is the third step. Um, it refers to how we use our senses to pick up on, up on um, or to assess stimuli that come our way, you may think to yourself, well, we can understand vision and we can understand, um, we can perhaps understand um, uh, hearing to an extent. But if you start to look around the world, then you, uh, the world around you, then you will very quickly realize that um, most of the world's famous marketers try to appeal to as many of these senses as possible. I wrote down on this slide, Apple, MasterCard, Visa, Singapore Airlines, Starbucks. You're familiar, likely, with, um, with all of these brands. One that I want to show you is um, Singapore Airlines. Um, for those of you who have, haven't flown with Singapore Airlines, um, what always strikes you is that their personnel are exquisitely dressed um, in very, very specific uniforms. And so what you see depicted on the slide are the colors that the various uh, flight attendants, stewardesses, managers, and so forth use. And then if you look at um, the paragraph beneath the, um, the images, um, I, I grabbed that one just because if you've ever flown with Singapore Airlines, then you will remember the specific sense, the very pleasant sense that you experience when taking that flight. And so this marketer realizes that um, the physical stimuli, we form strong memories. And when next we have, have to look for a plane to take us somewhere, an airline to take us somewhere, first thing that will come to mind is Singapore, Singapore Airlines. Um, an important consideration. It seems obvious that uh, consumers will, will pick up on things through their senses. Um, there's something called the, the um, absolute threshold. That is the minimum intensity of the stimulus be, uh, above which we can detect things. Sometimes marketers play games by making the intensity of their stimuli low to the extent that we don't physically think that we are picking up on the stimulus, which means that that particular stimulus is in the subliminal zone, if you would, yet it still, it still is picked up by consumers, okay? Um, the second really interesting aspect about our perception is the notion of the differential threshold. 
If you've ever been to a disco or to a place with loud music, what you may not have realized is that there's something called the differential threshold, meaning if you're already listening to loud music, then there's a certain minimum volume by which additional music has to come to you before you would even notice it. So that effect, the so-called just noticeable difference, manifests in many, many different ways in marketing, two of which are pricing and, believe it or not, consumer products. In terms of pricing, most of you will intuitively recognize schemes like this, where on the left-hand side, I have sunshine flakes. Well, if the sunshine flakes regularly costs $2.99, and I say I get a dollar off, that's a fairly significant amount of money. Most consumers will recognize because the differential, $1 on $2.99 is substantial. If you look at this, the snapshot on the right, it's the same dollar, except that instead of now paying $79.99 for a shirt, you're only paying $78.99. What do marketers know? The vast majority of consumers will not even realize that they're getting a deal on the shirt. Is this rational? The answer is no, because when all is said and done, the dollar that you are getting off on either the cornflakes or the shirt is the same dollar. So rationally, it shouldn't matter. However, our perceptual machinery is designed that we will likely notice the dollar off on the sunshine flakes, but not on the shirt. And of course, marketers exploit this, um, exploit this in many, many different ways. The second example is Toblerone. I'm assuming that many of you have had Toblerone bar. Um, what you may not know is that uh, one of the ways in which um, the manufacturer of Toblerone, Mondies International, can, can change um, the pricing of a Toblerone bar is by simply to reduce the number of peaks in the bar under the assumption that many consumers will not notice that, hey, now they have one or two peaks fewer in a Toblerone bar. This is actually a famous example from a couple of years ago um, where this happened after the 2008 recession. Um, what consumers don't recognize is if marketers, if marketers continue to charge the same price, but they subtly reduce the amount of, uh, amount of the offering that they give to consumers. We call that effect shrinkflation. As consumers, we lose, um, and marketers do it because of the differential threshold where we as consumers perhaps just don't recognize, um, just don't recognize that we do. Bear with me, I am almost, um, almost done. Um, the last thing that I wanted to show, show you was uh, the notion of perceptual organization. Um, so the consumer has been exposed to a stimulus, they've paid attention to it, and they are now perceiving it, which means somehow our psyche is making sense of what we're seeing. Um, so there's a very famous body of work, it's called Gestalt, um, which refers to how we make sense of chaos, if you would. The best way to explain Gestalt is through that image I, I posted on the, uh, on the slide, where most of you, most of us have seen movies where there's some crime that happened and the outlines of a person at the, at the bottom of a building. Well, we see the outlines of what looks like a person and we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we know this was a person? Because when all is said and done, technically, all you are looking at right now is a white line on a black background, yet we recognize it as a person. How does this happen? There are many different forms of gestalt um, that you see written down on the slide. The two that I wanted to call out are famous examples. There is um, 
the World Wildlife Fund, and most of us will recognize the panda. You have to ask yourself the question, how is it that we recognize uh, panda? Because technically what our eyes are perceiving are black blotches on a white background. Yet our perceptual system somehow closes the loop so that we perceive this as a panda bear. Another example is on this slide. This is something called figure and ground. Um, some people will look at this image and they will see the tree, a very, very nice big tree with lots of foliage. Other people will say, wait a minute, I am seeing a gorilla and a lion looking at each other. Okay, so the notion of figure and ground is the perceptual effect where it depends on where we get the consumer to look. And what, of course, consumers don't recognize is marketers can exploit this to convey a certain message, to create strong associations in the consumer's mind so that when they look for a solution to a problem, voila, we are, we are top of mind. Of of course, I had to show you this one. Now that you know about figure and ground, when you look at this, your initial reaction may be, well, this is just the logo of the George Washington University, perhaps not recognizing that you are looking at a great example of figure and ground because what's hidden in the logo is the Washington Monument. And so some consumers may just be focusing on the logo in general, Others may actually pick up on the fact that this is figure and figure and ground, a great illustration, um, a great illustration of it. Okay, I am just about um, done. Let me just quickly share this before I run out of time. Ah. One second, one second, one second. Final thing that I, final couple of things that I had for you is the step called comprehension. First step in comprehension is we have to identify what we're dealing with. That happens through something called categorization. It is a big, big topic, um, a big topic about which books have been written, then consumers have to figure out um, how to extract higher order uh, meaning from their stimulus, and ultimately they draw inferences, okay? What does inference drawing entail? Well, here is where brand names, symbols, product features, packaging, pricing, wording, atmospherics, a huge amount of marketing comes to life, okay? I show you this slide. This little slide has um, logos on it. If you look at this and you take a step back and ask yourself the question, well, what is common amongst all these brand logos? You'll realize that most of them contain smiles. Okay, there's the famous Amazon smile. There's the LG smile and what appears to be a wink. Hasbro has a smiling face um, and so forth. The psychology here says um, there's a great connection between the mind and the body. The human behavior is to return a smile if you're given one. So when we look at, for example, Argos, we see a smile. We are inclined to smile back. When we smile at something, that's our body telling our mind that we're happy. And then the question is, why would we not decide to exchange value with this particular marketer. Okay, packaging, many of you have experienced Absolute Vodka. Absolute Vodka is absolutely famous for how it leverages packaging to help consumers understand the value, the quality of this particular spirit. And perhaps the most impactful example is one of my personal favorites, it's Patek Philippe watches. And here you see on this slide, um, two faces of a Patek Philippe watch that goes for $31 million. The consumer inference is that that high price suggests quality, 
which signals the social message that the person who can afford this watch is incredibly successful and therein lies the inference um, consumers make by seeing somebody wear a $31 million Patek Philippe watch. Okay, that's the end of what I wanted to share with you today. Um, I know I've gone a little bit long, but um, here on this final slide, we have Maguire's process once more. And what I try to do is to just give you a glimpse at the beauty and the richness of what we have in each of the steps of this process. Thank you. And Sanjay, sorry, I went a little bit long. No problem. This has been extremely interesting, extremely insightful. I'm quite sure from the comments I've been seeing in the chat that they have found it extremely engaging and want to learn more. And uh, they wouldn't have mind if you would have gone on for another half an hour, 45 minutes. But unfortunately, we have other things on the agenda as well. But before we let you go, we quickly want to take two questions for you. So I see two questions come up in the Q&A box. I want to take those up. Uh, the first question is by Gaurav, and I'm going to rephrase it slightly. If as a consumer, Gaurav or me or anyone over here doesn't want to get influenced by these external factors, right? Doesn't want to be influenced and wants to uh, keep our decision making more neutral. What can we do to keep ourselves more conscious about what's happening? How do Lock yourself up and turn off your phone. Turn off the phone? <laughs> okay. So no Instagram, no social media. You can't escape it, basically. No, you know what? Um, it's a great question. Um, in the modern life, you cannot escape it. I think the most important thing is to be conscious of the fact that uh, marketers will, will use every single thing they can do to somehow um, be top of mind. And so what the consumer, the best thing the consumer can do is to remain balanced and to always consider multiple options. That is the single best thing you can do from a consumer perspective. That's fair. Uh, one question that's come up, this is from Harish, who's asking, wouldn't it be better to place ads at the top left corner in the newspaper? Because people are going to start reading from there. Isn't it better to just place the ad at the very top left corner? Um, intuitively, intuitively, it may be, it may feel like it because you're forcing the consumer to see it. But what we know is consumers become very skeptical about marketing. And the moment you frustrate the consumer, they will simply start to ignore the medium altogether. So what you have to do is to recognize that you have to play by the consumer's rules. And in the West, we allow them to read what they want to read. Let them eye, let their eyes go to the bottom right, and that's where you place the ad. In India, newspapers have started covering the very first page with the ad, so the whole first page is an ad, and then the news starts from the internal third or the fourth page. <laughs> People will stop reading them. You'll see. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. Great. So I'm going to take up one last question. I'm and I'm a little undecided, so I'm going to take up Puma's question over here. Uh, what if a person is loyal to a brand and suddenly, suddenly stops purchasing it? How do marketers attract such consumers back to the fold? Um, you have to understand first and foremost why they stop purchasing it. That's where it starts. And so from that perspective, doing marketing research is key. Um, and then you have to decide if that person is worth it. Because it is a fact that some consumers require a lot of work and a lot of investment from a marketing perspective, and they may not be worth it. However, I do appreciate Huma's question because um, uh, retaining customers, existing customers, is infinitely better than trying to find new ones, provided that your existing customers are profitable. And so you have to understand why they left, and then if it's worth it, try to get them back. Yeah, great. With that, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any more time to take more questions for you. So, Harish, my apologies. I'll not be able to pick up your question. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you for doing this masterclass. It's been wonderful. I'm seeing some comments come in the chat, and they are extremely appreciative. So, thank you for doing this and being with us for the last 50 minutes. But to the audience, don't go anywhere. We are going to speak with Kathleen very shortly. We're going to understand from her about how you can possibly go and study at GWSB and study from Dr. Pereira on campus. It's a beautiful city campus. We were talking about that. And on the screen behind uh, uh, him in the picture, you can see the entrance. 
uh, to the professor's gate. So we were just talking about that before we start the session. So if you want to study at George Washington School of Business, stay with us. We'll speak about the programs and the application fee waiver code and the special scholarships very shortly. But I want to thank Dr. Ferreira over here for taking us through this wonderful masterclass. It's been extremely insightful. Thank you, Joanne. You have a good day. Very much, Sunday. Thank you. Don't worry. And Kathleen, over to you. Please tell us about the programs at GWSP. I understand you offer 17, sorry, 13, I'm confusing, 13 or 17 different master's programs. So a lot of variety over there. We did a session on the sports uh, management program as well. That was extremely insightful last year. But we would love to know more about the programs that the other programs that GWSB offers. And please do take us to your presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. And thank you, everyone um, who's joining us. Good evening. Uh, my name is Catherine Connedy. I'm the Director of Recruitment and Admissions for the George Washington University School of Business. A little bit about GW's history and our campus. Um, during his lifetime, the namesake of our university, George Washington, the first president of the United States, had a vision for um, the creation of a university in our nation's capital. Uh, that vision was realized when the George Washington University was created in 1821. We were created by a federal charter, which is something we are very proud of. And having been created in 1821, that means that we just celebrated our bicentennial 200 year anniversary um, here on campus. You can see um, on the current slide, a little bit more about the location of the university and how centrally located we are within the heart of Washington, DC. So in the foreground, the buildings that are raised that you see are mostly um, buildings on campus. Uh, we're very close to the large green portion, which is the National Mall. You can see the Washington Monument, um, which was highlighted in our logo, the Lincoln Monument. Um, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts on the right um, to the top left also is the White House, um, where we're located also very close to um, the World Bank, the IMF, headquarters for for-profit businesses and NGOs. So we're really at the heart of where business and policy intersect in DC. A little bit about our recent rankings and recognition. Um, you can see some of the rankings we've had recently from the Financial Times, our international business department, for example, was ranked number one in the US and number two worldwide recently. Um, we have been number one for the last three years for the percentage of women enrolled in our global MBA program. Um, you can see from the US News and World Report rankings, um, some of our recent master's programs in addition to the MBA have received um, recognition in other, those rankings. And from Bloomberg Business Week, um, we've been ranked very highly, um, number two for diversity in the United States and number two for faculty quality as well. At the George Washington University School of Business, uh, this is an overview of the graduate programs that we offer. So we do have full, two full-time MBA formats, our global MBA and our accelerated MBA. Both of those MBAs do have a STEM track option. We offer 13 master's degrees in specialized areas, which are listed here. Every program that has an asterisk, a star at the end of the name is offered um, as, as a STEM designated program or has a STEM designated track of study that you can pursue. We also offer graduate certificates in over 20 different areas. Some highlights and some of the things that make the George Washington University School of Business um, different from other programs that you might learn about around the world. Um, highlights, of course, are world-class faculty. You've just gotten a taste of that from this lecture. An innovative curriculum. Our faculty um, and the school leadership are constantly in contact with leaders in the industry to learn about what skills they're looking for um, in employees. So our curriculum is dynamic and it is designed to make sure that you are um, up to date and are upskilled and employable um, when you're finishing your program. We of course have a dedicated career center. Um, students participate in several affinity and industry clubs, events and organizations. These things happen on, on campus and online, but being here in DC, this is part of the advantage of our location is, is our proximity to industry leaders um, and being able to host people on campus for these types of events. We also have an, an extensive and very involved alumni network, which is all over the world. 
Um, one of the things that makes the George Washington University School of Business different and distinguishes us um, from other programs is how flexible and customizable our degrees are. So those over 20 graduate certificates, many of them can be combined into a master's program or an MBA program. So you can not only earn your master's in a specific field, but also differentiate yourself by having a certificate credential um, in addition. Uh, this allows you to you know, showcase your skill set and what you've learned in graduate school. We offer over 200 electives um, within the School of Business and students may also take graduate courses outside the university or outside the School of Business, excuse me, in the university um, because there are other graduate units at GW. Um, we also offer uh, joint and dual degrees. We have a focus in the School of Business as well on experiential learning and that is incorporated into our programs um, in one form of uh, instruction as exchange programs. Um, there are long-term exchange programs, a semester long, where you might study um, at another school around the world, or short-term global and experiential or domestic study away programs where you could study with a faculty member in another city around the world or another city inside the United States. Um, to have that real world experience in an industry and, and to learn experientially with your peers um, in a new environment. I'll speak a little bit about our Career Center. Um, the Fowler Career Center is not just a place where um, GWSB students would go to have your resume looked over, say, or practice interview prep. These are, of course, things that they do, but their mission overall is to work with you from the moment that you start your program to create a career action plan, um, to work with you throughout your program to prepare you to be ready for the job market. So they are also in touch with uh, industry leaders and have career consultants that are in touch with um, inst institutions that are hiring and are able to help you showcase your skills and land that job after graduation. A sampling of some of our recent student landings. Um, now I'm looking very closely at these logos after having had our, our presentation. Um, but you can see that our, our students have landed in top consulting firms, for-profit institutions, non-governmental not, uh, non organizations, and not-for-profit institutions as well. So really broad um, range of contacts that our school has. And um, this is a result of the work of the Fowler Career Center with our current students and also, of course, our alumni network. And our alumni network does span the globe. We have over 53,000 graduate, graduates of the GW School of Business who are alums. Um, they span the globe across Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and the Americas. Um, so wherever you are in the world or wherever you think you may be looking to land after graduate school to get a job, there will be GW alumni there who will be able to um, network with you and help you. A little bit about our admission requirements. Um, so for international students, we do require an English language test score. The scores that are listed here are ideal scores. Um, it is possible to be admitted with scores slightly below these, but you would be required to take an additional English course during your first semester um, in the graduate program. We do provide exemptions for the English language test requirement for students who have taken uh, a degree in a country where English is the official language, such as the United States or the UK. We also require a transcript evaluation um, for credentials from outside the United States. We will accept a credential evaluation um, from any uh, service that's accredited by NASIS, the National Association of Credential Evaluation Services, for example, West, EC, or Spantran. Um, any of the companies on that accreditation list are acceptable. To fund your education, some considerations about the cost. Um, you can see tuition for our master's programs, depending on the number of credits required for the degree, is between 56,000 and 68,000 US dollars. The MBA program estimated cost is $117,000. These are this year's tuition rates. We do offer scholarships to students who apply for our programs. And I want to note that there's no separate application that is required for you to be considered for scholarships. All you need to do is complete the application materials and you'll be considered for scholarships 
as part of the admissions process. Um, one thing that you can do to really put yourself at an advantage for scholarship consideration is to apply early. So the earlier you apply in the cycle, um, the better uh, chance we have to be able to consider you for the widest range of funding options. The university also offers graduate assistantships and other fellowships. Um, and I would just want to note that those are not awarded. Assistantships are not awarded at the time of admission, but you are able to apply for an assistantship as a graduate student once you're here on campus. And so that's the information that I have for you today. If you have any questions, um, I think we have a little bit of time for question and answer, but also please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach us at the phone number listed here or at business at gwu.edu. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, to the audience, I've posted the link, I've posted the application fee waiver code in the chat. So it's go seed 0231. You can use that to apply to GWSB for this year's intake and get, an, get a waiver of the application fee for yourself. You can apply to any of the master's programs offered by GWSB. Um, of course, so there are scholarships which are offered by GWSB. Kathleen showed us the slide right now. There are merit scholarships and then there are assistantships, additional things that you can apply to. Plus, you can also apply to the Seed Business Leadership Scholarship Fund. This is for those of you looking to pursue a business master's program. You can click on the link in the chat and apply to our scholarship fund as well, which would make you eligible to receive $2,000 worth of scholarship in case you decide to pursue your higher education or your master's studies at GWSB. Uh, if you have any questions for Kathleen about the programs, please do feel free to post them in the Q&A box. We do have Dr. Ferreira with us still. We are over time, but uh, since I had left one question unanswered, I'll try taking this up uh, now and uh, so Dr. Ferreira, since you're here, I'm going to ask you one question which I left unanswered earlier. Doesn't it get difficult for marketers to make changes in products such as shrinkflation when more and more consumers get conscious and informative? Um, Sanjay, that it, it depends on the product, okay? So one of the critical things that people should recognize is that um, when we solve problems, we either spend a lot of time to solve the problem or we make it routine. If you are highly involved in, in a specific problem, then you will notice the finest details and marketers will find it very difficult to quote unquote bamboozle you. On the other hand, if it's something that you do routinely, Human beings make that as simple as possible. We put it on autopilot. So if you buy coffee, sugar, um, facial tissue, um, toothpaste, we don't want to think about that very deeply. Maybe, maybe the first time you think about buying it, uh, you spend a little bit of time on it, but then you do it, put it on autopilot. And in those cases, it's relatively easy for marketers to use shrinkflation to make us pay the same price for less, which if you really think about it, means the marketer exacted a price increase and we didn't even notice. True, true. I think we have all experienced it. And for a lot of us, the bulb is going on now. We're like, oh shit, that has happened to us. <laughs> Happy That's it. Us. But uh, Kathleen, there's a, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna exceed this session by five minutes. So we had. Uh, we are just over one hour into this session. I'm going to take a few more minutes. Uh, Kathleen, there's a question come up, and this is by Ashi, who's asking if there's a work ex requirement for the MBA program, or do you accept uh, candidates without work ex into the MBA program as well? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, the answer to that is yes, we do um, prefer that applicants to the MBA programs have work experience. We generally recommend um, a minimum of about two years of work experience. For our other master's programs, no work experience is necessarily required to apply. All right, great. Sashi, so that's the answer. If you're if you are currently someone without work experience, then maybe a business master's program may be more fit for you. If you already have two years or more of work ex, then maybe the MBA is the option to look at. Uh, so uh, Kathleen, I know the answer. Okay, let me take Arisha's question first about the GMAT score requirement. So I understand GWSB is GMAT optional. Is it true for the MBA program as well and all the master's programs? 
Yes, we are a test optional. Um, so if you have GMAT or GRE scores that you feel will enhance your application, please send them along when you apply, um, but they're not required as part of the application process. All right, great. So Arish, I hope this answers your question. Pratika, I have I've seen your question uh, and there are three upwards, so there are more people getting interested in it. But uh, I know the answer already, but I'm still gonna ask you, Catherine, does GWSB offer any programs related to psychology? Uh, Grant, your session has really inspired people to instead of pursuing a career in marketing, pursue a career in psychology now. So yeah, yes, Sam, um... uh, what I what what I just wanted to quickly say is um, I really appreciate that question because, as a matter of fact, for you to understand consumer behavior, you have to study anthropology sociology and so psychology so that question about a master's degree in or a graduate degree in psychology is absolutely appropriate um you'll become a great marketer by studying that so sorry sorry Kathleen. no thank you that's very helpful and and to answer that question the university does offer graduate programs in psychology and that discipline lives within the college of arts and sciences so Pratika, that's your answer. So there's George Washington University offers a course. George Washington School of Business may not, but you can look up the course at the GW University's website and you'll find more information over there. All right, great. Uh, Momina, yes, we will share the recording of the session. So the session is being recorded. It would go, it would be put up on YouTube by tomorrow and you'll be able to access it over there. And Amala, I think that's your question as well. So the recording would be made available tomorrow. Uh, to you as well. So with that, uh, we have exhausted all the live questions and just about in time. So thank you to the audience. Thank you for being patient with us and sticking with us till the very end. So thank you for doing that. I hope you found the session insightful, enjoyed it. And uh, last thing before we wrap up this session, I quickly want to post this. We are actually doing one more session with GWSB next week. This is uh, around how to make informed decisions for your higher studies. I'm going to post a link for that in the chat window very shortly. But uh, thank you. In the meanwhile, I want to thank uh, uh, Kathleen. I want to thank Dr. Pereira for doing this session. It's been extremely insightful. And I personally enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm quite confident the, our audience did as well. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. Yeah. Really appreciate having you here. And thank you, Catherine. Great. Yes, thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure to you. join you all today. Thank you to both of you. Those of you who are still in the room, I've posted the link to the next session in the chat window. This is again with GWSB. So we are speaking to another faculty from George Washington School of Business. This is about if higher education is worth the cost. We, we are going to do net present value analysis in that one. So it's a, going to be a very informative masterclass. So if you're looking for taking that decision about your higher studies, you can register for that session as well and see us over here next week. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Catherine, once more. Both of you have a great day.